Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Welcome to the tennis.com podcast. I'm your host, Kamal Murray, and we are here with somebody I consider a friend, uh, many consider a mentor. He is the head of senior, senior director of talent identification and development uh, for the USTA and general manager of player development uh, right now for USTA. So he holds a job that was formerly held by Patrick McEnroe, a very important and prestigious job. Uh, one of the first African-Americans to hold that job. Uh, and it is by no mistake because he's more than qualified. We are here with Martin Blackman. Martin, welcome to the show. Thanks, Kamal. It's great to be here. Always <laughs> great talking tennis with you. So you know what's funny? It's like in doing these things, it actually, you know, I know all the people, but it forces you to sit down and actually go back through their history, sure. their resume, their junior careers, good and bad, right? You know, um, but I want to talk about sort of how you got in tennis, right? Because you were born sure. in New York, uh, lived in Barbados, and your name has come up on a couple of these podcasts with your time at Bolitary. Sure. Uh, so, you you know, given an opportunity to train at Bolitary with that great generation. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I still want to talk about that. So, so tell me how you got into tennis uh, growing up in Barbados, because it is not, I mean, you know, we've heard of Darien King, right? But it is <laughs> not a, uh, an island known for tennis. Yeah, that's right. More known for cricket. Right. So, yeah, I'll go really quickly, Kamal. So, I was born in New York. Um, my dad was going to college in New York. Um, and then when I was two years old, my dad, my family moved back to Barbados. And, um, you know, I lived there for 10 years until t until the age of 12. My brothers uh, played tennis. My I have two twin brothers who are 10 years older than me. And they played tennis. They played tennis, and they basically taught me how to play. And um, my first memory of tennis kind of the, inspired me was in 1975. We didn't, we couldn't get the broadcast, the TV broadcast in Barbados, but we listened to on the radio to Arthur Ashe um, beating Jimmy Connors in 75. And that was kind of, to me, that's my first kind of inspirational memory of tennis and um, started playing and getting more serious and, you know, just having a hero like that. And then we used to spend a couple summers in New York. And during this one summer, I was able to try out for the Port Washington Tennis Academy program. And, you know, it's funny because you you know this as well as I do and and, and your listeners do as well. But in life, you can look back to opportunities that people gave you along the way that you wouldn't have been able to pay for or have access to. And a gentleman called Bob Benz at the Fort Washington Tennis Academy uh, came up to me and my mom when we were walking out. Um, we had said, hey, thanks so much. We really enjoyed the tryouts, but we can't afford the program. Um, and he walked out and he said, we're going to give you a scholarship. So that was the first formal coaching that I got at Fort Washington for two summers in a row. And then Nick Volatari, again, an opportunity that I wouldn't have been able to afford, came up to me. I'd lost in the finals of the Orange Bowl in the 12 and under. He said, I'm going to give you a scholarship to my academy. So, uh, yeah. And then, you know, like you said, um, at Nick's, I mean, Jim was there, Jim Courier, Andre was there. Uh, David Wheaton came a little bit later in his high school career. Pete Sampras, uh, Monica Sellis. It was just, it was just an amazing time uh, to be in a place like that. And you kind of took it, you didn't take it for granted. You knew it was special, but looking back, it, it's even more special just looking back at some of those great players. Like when you were in it, you know, you just, it's hard to like really look at him like, wow, all of us are about to be future legends in this game, right? Including yourself. And it was like, y'all just kids on campus. I mean, I've been at Bulletary and it was like, I mean, this is like a tennis player's playground. Tell me about those years, right? Because we hear the academy stories, kids sure, running sure. wild. We hear, you know, Uncle Nicky in the back with his flashlight, <laughs> you know, saying, you're going to be the greatest, you know what I mean? He often got criticism about, about not being a great technician, right? Sure. And, and just being a motivator as if that's a small thing. 
Tell me about those days at the, I mean, Arias was there too, right? Tell me about yeah, those Jimmy days. Arias, Aaron Quickstein. I mean, <laughs> you you name it. So first of all, go, I'm, I might be a legend in my own mind, but those guys are real legends, Jim and Andre and Pete. Um, but I think a few, so a couple, a few things that made it special. And I actually was able to tell Nick this over the last few years and express my gratitude to him. Number one was the work ethic and the discipline at the academy was next level. Um, and I think that came a little bit from Nick's military background. He's, he was paratrooper. Um, it also came from the way he lived his life. But all of us who were on scholarship had to do scholarship jobs. I don't know if you could get away with that these days, but <laughs> I mean, I'm talking real jobs come out, yeah. like, you know, cooking in the kitchen, doing the courts, stringing rackets. Um, and that was kind of a source of pride for us because we felt like, hey, we have, Nick has given us this opportunity, but we're also working our butts off as well. Right. So that was one. Two is that it was just the intensity of the training. Um, you know, now in the mo the modern way we train, it's usually two hours in the morning, two in the afternoon. Back then it was just four hours straight. So you got back from school at noon, you kind of shoveled some food in mm. and you're on the court from one to five. And then the third thing is along with the motivation that you mentioned, Nick is probably the best, the, the best motivator I've ever seen. But along with that motivation, there's what I would call a positive peer pressure. So if Andre goes and wins, you know, a small pro event, then Jim Curry is like, well, I beat Andre in a practice match last week. I can do that. And so just all this piggybacking of guys having great results at different levels, all the way up to you get to a French Open when Jim and uh, Andre play each other. And Jim got him at that one um, after the rain delay. Um, and then Andre wins Wimbledon and Pete was the first one to win, you know, to win a slam and everybody was like, I can beat. So that was really, really special. And I think um, if you ask Jim or Andre or Pete or Monica or Jimmy Arias or Aaron Krikstein or Becker, they'll all say the same thing that the environment that Nick created made him, made him great. Now, how does that shape? what you're trying to do with USCA now, right? Because you kind of have a very similar sort of uh, goal and opportunity at the national campus, right? To get the best guys here, create some very healthy peer pressure, right? Um, how does that, how is that experience, or has, is that the experience that shaped your, and your goal for the center? Yeah, and that's a great point, Kamal. And, and the simple answer is yes. Um, one of the things that we, that we try to do with the program. And there's really three parts to it. So, and I know you're gonna talk a little bit later about tournaments and so on, but one of them is around a partnership with the private sector and the recognition that like the coaches that work for you in Chicago and the great coaches that we have around the country that are developing players, that if we're gonna be successful, the relationship with those coaches has to be as strong as possible. It has to be a service mentality. Um, we have to approach that relationship with a lot of humility. Um, and we have to look for ways to support those coaches so that as many players as possible can stay at home for as long as possible and develop at home. Hmm. So that's kind of the, that's the foundation of it that we developed with the camp structure. Um, but then to your point, when we do have camps at every level, all the way up to collegiate, preseason, pro, we're trying to create that environment where there's always something on the line. So you're playing off for a wild card. You're playing off to go on a trip. Um, and the more we do that, the more we can create that competitive environment with our best players, um, the more it creates that positive peer pressure. And it's really positive. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, the, the thing that's ironic is that you look at our top women and our top men, they're all friends. They all like each other. Yeah. You know, yeah. they really like each other. They're really happy when, when they do well, but they're super competitive when they play each other. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I, I, I want that, but I'm happy that she got it. Right. Exactly. And, and I think that 
that culture amongst this generation is there now, right? Where you're, you, you sort of look up and realize, wow, it's really hard for me to hate this person because I'm going to see him again next week in Dubai or I'm going to see him next week in Dubai, right? And so if I'm going to have a happy, healthy life on the road 38 weeks, I got to just say, we're going to be friends, right? You know, Absolutely. you got to form the friendships. It can't be yeah. all enemies, right? It's like, hey. And like you, and you, you know, Kamal, that, all, that wasn't always the case. Yeah. It's, you know, it was wasn't always the case. Um, you coach Sloan and you see how how genuinely happy Sloan is for our other women when they do well and how gracious she is. And I think a lot of that was built on, on the BJK Cup teams. Um, and then on the guy's side, it's the same as well. I, I looked at a post-match interview with Tommy down under and he said, well, I'm really happy because there's going to be an American in the semifinals. And for him to say that now, of course, he's thinking, I want to kick Ben's butt. Right, right. I mean, you know, <laughs> right? We know what he's thinking. But for him to have the presence of mind to say that he's happy for American tennis, um, that kind of shows you where the culture is right now. Yeah, I think healthy competition is what the sport needs. I, I, I got a Nick Boateri story. So back when I was trying to build my academy, obviously it sounded really ambitious based on where I was building it. Sure. And, you know, I called Nick, said, hey, Nick, I need you to come up here and build belief. Because that's what he was great at, to your point, right? So good, yeah. And he landed. He, I tried to buy my first class ticket. He said, nope, Southwest flies to the airport that's closest to my house, put me on Southwest, right? So he flew Southwest. He landed at 730, had my boy Aaron Maber pick him up from the airport. We went and did like tennis clinics in the schools, went and met with the mayor, President University of Chicago. He said, I got something for you. This is right at the same time he was selling IMG, selling Boletary to IMG. Okay. He was like, hey, Mr. Mayor, these things work. And here's a $2 billion contract with your brother to prove it works. Wow. Right. And from then on, it was like, uh, OK, I guess I guess I guess we can do this right kind of thing. Uh, and we went dinner and he flew back home the same night, didn't even spend a night. But again, when you think about the relationship with, I mean, obviously he could say, no, I got my own academy and, and brave. Right, right, right. I, don't, I don't need you doing while I'm taking business away or whatever. Right. Yeah, it was not yeah. that, right. It was yeah. good relationship with the private sector while kids are at home. Kamal will send kids to me that need to come to me. Right. 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 right? Um, but it was like that healthy sort of, relationship that I think the USTA now is having with the private sector. Yep. Uh, understanding that you can't take everybody, right? So you might as well work with me to say, here's one you should take, right? Absolutely. And it, I mean, I love that story about Nick and um, your listeners will as well. That kind of shows you a little bit about the type of person he was. But to your point as well is it's a mutual decision, right? Because sometimes the player should stay with their coach mm -hmm. and we should find ways to support them when they're 15, 16, 17, 18, even into the pros. Sometimes the coach comes to us and says, Hey, you know what? I can't provide the customized training. I can't do the weeks on the road right now. Um, I've got a really good relationship with one of your national coaches. I really want this player to work with you guys full time in Orlando and Carson. And I think being open to both of those scenarios come out has been a big part of the of the success um, and not thinking that we need to um, be in control of everyone. Yeah. Yeah. So we talk about the stride that American tennis has made. And there's like three players that sort of stick out to me that have like just, you know, legendary pedigree, right? Peter, uh, Sebastian Corda. Yeah. Who's dad? You have a win over in the dream <laughs> US Open, right? That's true. Uh, You're going way back. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. Did you, so do you ever see his dad like, yeah, you know, I still whipped your butt, daddy. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> then you got Ben Shelton, who obviously yeah. had a agree with Brian Shelton. Yeah. And then Brandon Holt, who I don't know that everyone has connected that as Tracy Austin's son. That's right. Yeah. Um, Tell me about that, because I look at all three of those players and say, how they get so good so fast? Yeah. Obviously, they're probably, you know, there are American players who are getting great, you know, doing well on ATP tour and into their 20s. Sure. To be teenagers doing this, that speaks to pedigree. 
Talk about those three. Yeah. Well, I think in all three cases and some other cases that we're seeing with somebody like a Casper Rude and his dad, Christian Rude, I think that is kind of the epitome of the former great player, former great athlete who takes that knowledge um, but maintains the relationship as a father, as a mother. Um, and if you're able to do that, it's a, it's a really beautiful thing. You know, on the one hand, you've got the unconditional love of a parent. So even if you had a really bad practice, you're not bringing it back to the dinner table. Um, but on the other hand, you've got the knowledge of somebody who's played at the highest level, like a Tracy or a Peter or a Brian, and they're not going to sugarcoat it. So, hey, come on, you told me you want to be number one in the world. Well, what you did today isn't going to get you there. Mm-hmm. You know, have it, being able to have those kind of conversations um, and balance it out, I think it's really difficult to do. But when, it, when you are able to do it, like both Brian, Peter, and, and Tracy have been, it's a pretty, it's a beautiful thing. And those, yeah. are, three, those are three amazing uh, character individuals with Sebi, Sebi, Ben, and Brandon. And I think what's funny is none of those three coached their kids. It, when, 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 ben, when Ben came and played our tournament, I said, Brian, you coming? He said, eh, I got to go recruit to Kalamazoo. If he lasts long enough, I'll come toward the end. Right, you know, yeah. and then Tracy, you know, uh, Brandon Holt played our event. Tracy's like, "Yeah, my boy's coming out there. Look out for him. Make sure he doesn't cause any trouble." I'm like, "You're not coming?" She's like, "Nah, he'll be okay." It's just like it's very interesting to have those. Yeah, parents- the, right. The the mindset of not making some of those mistakes of, you know, being being that helicopter parent and making the kid dependent. You know, they both develop their players. But as their players, as Brandon got older, Ben got older, and um, and um, and Sebi, they both kind of, they all three of those parents have facilitated the process of those players becoming more independent, mm. and that's a huge part of being a champion is being independent. Yeah. So you won. You were on part of a team that won two national championships at Stanford. Talk about the college experience because, you know, for a long time, we see college be sort of the graveyard. Sure. Right, professional, on the men's side, to a professional career. Yeah. Um, and we don't see that anymore. We see it as like a good stepping stone, a great way to sort of let your body develop. Um, you know, I think that also speaks to your pedigree and your experience when you think about um, background as a player. You lived on an academy, sure. right? Uh, which now USTA has a big campus. Uh, yeah. So you know what academy life is like. Play college tennis. You know how that transitions successfully and unsuccessfully to the pros. Yeah. We're coach at JTCC, which gives you experience in like the nonprofit sort of community grassroots sure. Sure. development sector. Talk about that time at Stanford, because when you think about when they say, oh, Martin Black is going to be the new head of PD, you're like, well, why him? I was like, what? Well, well, look at everything he's done, right? And he went to Stanford. We had a brother that went to Stanford, right? Talk about the time there. I uh, thanks for that, Kamal. I appreciate that. So, yeah, I mean, look, it, it goes in cycles, right? And um, I remember that paradigm shifted in the in the eighties when Jimmy Arias turned pro early, um, Eric Quickstein turned pro early, Becker turned pro early. And up until the early 80s, it was almost a given that American players would go to college for at least one or two years before they turned pro. Um, but that really changed everything. And then you had Michael Chang. You had some other um, young players like um, the Giamava brothers and Tommy Ho and so on. And, you know, when I was at Stanford, one of the things I saw with Coach Gould, who had coached so many great players and so many great teams, is that when he thought you were ready to turn pro, he would tell you. So, you know, you think, oh, I want this guy back for his junior year. I want this guy back for his senior year. But that was part of his greatness as a coach is, you know, he would tell a David Wheaton, you're ready. You know, you're ready to go, you know, or Jeff Tarango. 
um, and he'd tell you if he thought you needed another year or two. So it's really it's really good to see college back as part of the pathway uh, from Isner to Stevie to Ben um, to all the players, Marcus Hurell, Mackie McDonald, and also on the women's side as well, um, Jenny Brady, Danielle Collins, Arena Falcone. Because I just think that only having, when a kid is about to graduate from high school at 17 or 18 years old, and they're not quite ready emotionally, physically, mentally, um, to go on tour. College is such a great part of the pathway to give you that one, two, three, four more years to develop and still play at a really, really high level. Um, and I think we lost a lot of players in the 90s and the early 2000s that turned pro right out of high school because, to your point, they felt like college was a graveyard for their dreams but that's not the case anymore. And now I think what we have now is USGA pro circuit events. So we've yeah. got some 25s, we've got some 75s, we've got some hundreds where the players can, let me just step out there, see how I do this in this event. Exactly. Right? So talk about the important, because when I think about pro careers, right? And I look at sort of for years, the Europeans have had an advantage, right? If sure. you live in France, Germany, Austria, uh, Italy, you could basically train to these, you know, take a train to these different countries and travel and stay affordably almost every weekend. You can go Absolutely. somewhere, lose yeah. first. Yeah. And I know, you know, now that there are some more talented kids playing college, there isn't, there is a need to like, all right, here's, here's a new circuit of 25s or 50s or 75s to yeah. go out there and see if you're ready. Yeah. Right. Um, Talk about the importance of those events and how we can, or how you're working to create a system where those events uh, happen as often as they do in Europe so that our pipeline can be as good as theirs is. Yeah. So I think, you know, when we look at the USDA as a whole, it's such a team effort in what we do with the private sector and the sections and with facilities and club owners like you and, and great coaches like yourself. And, everyone listening. So there's a developmental pathway, right? But there's also a competitive pathway. And if you wanna optimize all the resources that are being spent against both those pathways, you gotta make sure they're aligned. So what we try to do is because we don't have the resources in the aggregate to have as many events as all of Western Europe, we try to look holistically at the calendar. So we say, okay, we've got our best 15 to 18 year olds. We've got our best collegians. We've got our best rookie pros. We've got the pros that haven't quite broken into the top 100. Um, we've got these times of the year where they're probably going to play outside the country. And then we've got these junior tournaments. So really looking at the 52 weeks almost as a puzzle and plugging in events that we feel will maximize the return on investment for those specific player groups. And that's why having the 80K at your place um, last year was huge because you know that's going into a summer swing where the guys may not be able to get into in Atlanta. It's, a, it's the 10 days before Cincinnati. And then you get a player like Ben Shelton going there and winning that event that makes a stronger case for him to get a main draw law card into Cincy instead of a quality card. Um, and then he gets that card and he does damage. We saw what he did um, yes. with that win over Casper. Um, and I think he beat Sonego in the first round. So he, that tournament is part of the story that we're talking about from Australia. Yes. Right. Yeah. That's, that's I mean, all. That's all part of it. Right. That, that, that was crazy, crazy twist of events. So you text me, say, hey, this is an important week on the calendar. Kamal, we had an event fall off. Can you host this event? hundred percent. I had just actually had Brian on the podcast in June. Ben gets a wild card. Right. Was actually considering pulling out. Right. Advanced okay. far in the event. Gets to the semis. Consider pulling out to go play qualies in Cincy. I'm like, oh, no, we got to work together here, right? That's, we we cannot right. have one event get killed because he's got to go play qualies of another. So we need to upgrade this wild card, right? 
So you upgrade the wild card. Because here's the thing, at that level, for a player like Ben, a bad matchup in qualies, maybe he doesn't make main draw. Just because he made third round in main draw, absolutely. doesn't mean he would have yep. made it through qualies based That's on right. that, right? That's right. So, so that main draw wild card then leads into Senego, then beats Casper Rue, and probably was like the biggest light bulb at that time, but damn, I can go pro, right? You know what I mean? For sure. That and was so cool. like, that's your foresight of saying, this is an important week. Can we have this event? You know what I mean? And I think, I'm sure he'll look back. I know his dad for sure is cerebral, like, oh, that that helped. No, that was huge, Come out. That was huge. And, you know, for your listeners, I mean, you stepped up on like four months notice and it's such a heavy lift to run an event like that. Um, and the momentum, right? You win the event, you go into the main uh, with the belief, you go into the open with the belief. He finishes the year, wins three challengers in a row, um, and he gets into the Aussie Open without a walk card. So, but that part of like, you know, the ripple effect of, you, it doesn't always work that way, but that's part of the ripple effect. And that's why the stakeholder relationships are so important because we know each other. We know you as a coach. We know you as a club owner and we know you as a tournament director. So having people like that who really care about American tennis, you know, they're not doing it to make, you're not doing it to make money. Yeah, you're doing it to make any money, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go there, but, oh, yeah. <laughs> but but I know where you know I know where your heart's at. Yeah, and that that was huge. It was fun to watch. It was fun to be here. It was it was it was so fun to watch. So I'm gonna I'm gonna call out some American some names of American players, uh, and I want you to give me one sort of the first word that comes to your mind. Okay. Uh, we'll go Jesse Pagula first. Smooth. Coco Golf. Tenacious. Francis TFO. Gosh. That's a that's a loader one come out. <laughs> you know Francis for so long. I love I love I love him. Uh for Francis, I'm gonna go electric. Like his outfit at the Australian Open, right? Like his outfit and like his tennis. <laughs> uh Sloan. Graceful. Jensen Brooksby. Blue collar. Taylor Fritz. Competitor. Ben Shelton. Athlete. Eubanks. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> UB. UB. Throwback. Besides giraffe, besides giraffe, Chris, we got to throw that I'm, one out there. I'm gonna say throwback for UB. Mm -hmm. He's got the he's got those old school strokes. He's smooth. Yeah, he's committed to that one hand backhand. I swear, I said, man, with that two hand, you probably win some more matches. Like, oh, I'm committed to the one hand, baby. Uh, Alicia Parks. Gosh, I'm so happy to see that win last weekend. Um, that was great. To oh beat, my gosh. To beat uh, Garcia in Lyon. Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, just, and she almost lost the semi match. Yeah. And two match points, in my opinion, got a little too cool for school. Got it. Got right? it. You know what I mean? But kind of recovered. Yeah. I'm going to say explosive for Alicia. I like that one. <laughs> this last one is not American, but we both have spent a lot of time with this brother. I can only understand one out of every four words he says. Darian King. <laughs> Darian King is, is Irie. Irie, man. Cool. <laughs> oh, man. I was going to say, for you to go from Barbados, let me tell you, I've met three people that are Bayesian, right? That's what they say. Are Bayesian. Not Bayesian, yeah. And I cannot, when they speak to each other, I, it's like they're speaking French. I cannot understand anything. It's a very strong dialect. <laughs> but that's why you got to spend a lot of time down there, come out so you can understand it. Oh, man. He and I would travel with Sloan and we'd be talking, talking. Me and Sloan would look at each other like, what did you say? Like, you know, everything is boy, boy, boy. And this, you know, it's just like a whole different dialect. So who's next? The names I did not call. Sure. Uh, you know, USTA, I think, has 
uh, sort of the best pulse on who's got a, a, a sort of not a, there is no clear path to pro tennis. Don't get me wrong, but sure. a, a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Well, some, some names for your listeners, some young ones that um, are on a really good pathway. Ashlyn Kruger, um, Robin Montgomery, Katrina Scott, Claire V. Nagunier. On the boys' side, Zach Svita, um, Alex Vida Mickelson, too. Ethan Quinn. Uh, so I think that, you know, that's always kind of what we look at is okay our, we've got we got some really really good players in the top 50 top 20 top 10 but we're always looking back a few years to make sure the pipeline's full and those players that I just mentioned are are on a top 50 pathway with the work ethic and the mentality so we're really excited about them yeah I saw Zach Spider play here I think got to the semis here uh smooth game yeah uh Really, really smooth, good mover. I mean, just doesn't overplay, doesn't, doesn't overplay, doesn't overplay, like, you know, plays one shot ahead. Yeah. You know, knows how to kind of manage the court and uh, he's starting to put it together. So, and again, those two guys, um, Alex Mickelson and Ethan Quinn, all, both going to Georgia, um, are having some really good results. They're 04 birth year, so they turned 19 this year. Okay. Now, last question before you've been very generous with your time is, you know, one of the things that I think the common or the, the tennis fan doesn't, is not quite clear on is the role of, you know, what's the big deal about Davis Cup? What's the big deal about BJK Cup? Yeah. What is the role of the Federation? Why do we see, you know, Jeff Russell, Kathy Rinaldi, Martin Blackman sitting there in the in the player's box cheering the player on? Mm -hmm. right? What do they really do? How does this whole sort of thing work together? Um, obviously, there's money in, in, in winning Davis Cup for Federation, right? Sure. And sure. All, the, all the efforts are to, you know, support our players. So talk, talk to me about sort of the system um, that ultimately, the role of the Federation that ultimately sort of highlights or pinnacles with Davis Cup and Billie Jean King Cup. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Kamal. So I would pro I'd highlight three things. And so the, the first thing I would say is that one of the responsibilities of the Federation is to create aspirational goals that are just part of a culture that's striving for excellence. So if you look at the universe of players that play tournaments or in the competitive pathway or what we call high performance players, 99% of them are going to go to college and probably 1% of them will turn pro and we'll, we'll watch them on the big stages and we'll watch them at BJK cup and, and Davis cup. But the health of the ecosystem is those 99% of those players that go to college. Those are the future leaders of our sport. So when you have a culture that's inspiring to excellence, having success at the highest level is a huge part of pulling people into the sport. It's kind of the same way I told you, about, you know, listening to a BBC radio broadcast of Arthur Ashe winning Wimbledon in 1975. Um, think about the thousands of experiences like that that kids have every year that inspire them to pick up a racket or in most cases probably inspire their parents to choose tennis. Mm -hmm. um, as a sport for their child. So Davis Cup and BJK Cup are, have a really strong aspirational influence. They're symbolic in that way. Um, but I think the other part of why they're so important is that the team dynamic that happens um, in those matches and the different women and the different men who play on those teams, that becomes also part of the strength of the culture. So when I'm at a BJK Cup and, you know, Sloan is there, Coco Vanderway, Coco Goff, Ali Risk, Madison Keys. I mean, those, those women are playing for something that's bigger than themselves. They're playing for Team USA. They're playing for the flag. Um, and that is something that everybody can relate to. Whether it's a 14-year-old girl that just plays high school tennis. Um, 
whether it's, um, you know, a, a league player um, in a 3-5 league, everybody can relate to what it means to be part of a team and what that commitment means. And everybody can relate to representing your country and how special that is. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's what makes Davis Cup and BJK Cup so special. And then our role when we're there, obviously Kathy is a captain. So she's a, she has a coaching and management role. But for me, um, it's just about showing the emotional support and the respect to those players. Um, I was in Tashkent a couple of days ago. Um, you know, maybe not the most glamorous place in the world, but I wanted those guys, I wanted the guys to know that um, it's an honor and a privilege for me to be there to support them. Mm -hmm. um, and I take it really seriously. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'll be in Delray in April. And, uh, and there is financial reward for country. And, there, that, and the winning team, yep. Yeah. So the, the winning teams, all the teams get compensated, as you know, from the quarters on. Um, but the prize money for the finalists and the winning teams is quite substantial. Mm -hmm. And that's something that can go back to funding a federation. So yeah. um, that, you know, that, that makes it real. And I'd say, so, you know, when you look at like, um, you know, from being at Slams, right, and being a private coach. Sure. Um, and, you know, you walk past Martin at the lunch table and, oh, he's sitting there, he's talking, he did it out, right? I feel like those are like four times a year, there are conventions of our sport. And That's those cool. conversations continue to move uh, the sport forward. That's uh, right. But also, you know, the difference between winning and losing at that level is 10%. And yeah. sometimes that's a, I'm standing in line and when we be uh, behind you and you say, hey, oh, next up on you plays this, 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 oh, watch out for this, right? Sometimes that is worth the trip, right? 100%. Being able yeah, to- I mean, you, you, you nailed it. You nailed it, Kim out. I mean, we're talking about percentage points. Um, and if whether it's Ola or Kathy or Kent or one of our national coaches, if you know in years past, if there's one little thing that we can help you with when you're working with Sloan, you know that we'll do it. Whether you you know it's a call to Dave Ramos or Jeff about, hey, I want to see the reverse scouting report on this player, um, and those are the little things that it's hard to put a value on. Mm -hmm. um, and a big part of it for us is from learning, learning from you, mm -hmm. from the coaches of the players and the players is there's a lot of learning that goes on for us is how can we do a better job of supporting our players. But those little percentage points are hard to quantify, but um, you can feel it. You know, you feel it when that player looks up and you're fist pumping and they know that their federation really cares. And it's not just if they win. They, it's unconditional. That support has to be unconditional. So I appreciate you pointing that out. Yeah. Well, man, you've been very generous with your time. I want to, um, you know, thank you. Just you've been supportive. Uh, I can name two or three times where a quick little tidbit uh, as I'm running to get my fifth cup of coffee uh, <laughs> of, of the day, you know, <laughs> uh, has been helpful and probably made the difference in the match. So um you know i want to just thank you for everything you do for american tennis i know it's, thank you come on i know it's not an easy job to be in the top spot uh and you know a lot of times you feel like you're the complaint department uh but we recognize the sacrifice that you do um and that you've made you know for the sport so thank you I so appreciate much that come out it's a it's a privilege my friend it's a privilege so thank you and thanks to your listeners well, this has been a Tennis.com podcast with Martin Blackman. Thanks for listening.